Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome. I'm Robert George. I have the honor to be the director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions, uh, and it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you here. Uh, I, uh, to my loss, uh, was out of town for Dr. Cass's first uh, two lectures, but I uh, uh, understand that they were wonderful and provoked wonderful conversations, and I look forward to uh, more of that uh, this afternoon. Uh, before formally introducing Dr. Cass, I want to say a special word of thanks to Dr. Charles E. Test, who is the founder of this particular feast. Uh, Dr. Test is a Princeton alumnus, uh, a retired physician now in his 90s, uh, living in Indiana. Uh, and Dr. Test, I think, gave us the first gift that came for an individual from the Madison program, for the Madison program when we were established uh, back in uh, 2000. And that gift was used to establish the Charles E. Uh, Test uh, lectures. And uh, so we are extremely grateful uh, to him, and we want to record uh, our thanks to him uh, today. Well, what a, what a pleasure and an honor it is for me to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Cass uh, to Princeton and to introduce him. He's the Addie Clark Harding Professor in the Committee on Social Thought uh, in the college and uh, at, the University of, uh, at the University of Chicago. He's also Hertog Fellow uh, at the American Enterprise Institute. Another uh, connection, Roger. Hertog, uh, for whom that fellowship is endowed, is a member of the uh, uh, Advisory Council of the James Madison Program. Dr. Cass served as uh, chairman of the President's Council on Bioethics from 2002 to 2005, and he continues as a member of that uh, council. Dr. Cass uh, was born and brought up in uh, Chicago. He was educated at the University of Chicago, from which he also took his uh, medical degree. Uh, he left uh, the womb of Chicago briefly to earn a PhD at Harvard University, uh, after which, uh, in due course, he returned to Chicago, where he has been professor uh, ever since. He has taught at St. John's uh, College in Annapolis, Maryland, the famous Great Books uh, program there, uh, and at the uh, Kennedy Institute for Ethics at Georgetown University. Uh, his works not only uh, extend to the field of bioethics, uh, where he is a leading figure and indeed a founding father, uh, but also in uh, other domains, uh, including his uh, very much admired, rightly admired, uh, works on the Bible. Uh, he and his wife, Dr. Amy Cass, who we have the pleasure of welcome, welcoming with us uh, uh, today as well, uh, are editors of a wonderful anthology called Wing to Wing, Or to Or, Readings on Courting uh, and Marrying. Uh, that's a, a work that has had a lot of influence with some of our students uh, on this campus, and we're grateful to the Casses uh, for that. Uh, so I uh, ask you now to join me in welcoming for the third Charles, Charles E. Test Lecture, uh, Dr. Leon Cass. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Robbie, and thanks uh, to so many of you for coming out on this uh, day fit for ducks. Um, some of you have been here through these three days. I appreciate your presence. Uh, I've appreciated uh, thoroughly the, the hospitality, the generosity of the Madison program, its fellows, its leadership, and, and also the various members of the audience uh, uh, who have who've been with me these last three days. Uh, Mrs. Cass and I have had a wonderful time here with you, and thank you all very much. Um, this uh, third lecture is entitled the Dignity of Human Flourishing, Biotechnology and the Pursuit of Happiness. How can we keep human life human in the coming age of biotechnology? What challenges do we face in promoting and protecting human dignity? Yesterday's lecture considered the foundational dignity of human being, the dignity of human existence as such, and the dangers it confronts in end-of-life decision-making and care. Today's this lecture will consider the full dignity of being human, the dignity of human flourishing, and the dangers it confronts in using biotechnical powers to enhance our performances, improve our nature, and secure our happiness. These bold prospects, advocated by a growing number of bioprofits, have raised public anxiety about biotechnology and the human future, expressed in concerns about man playing God or about the arrival of Brave New World or a post-human future. They also raise weighty questions about the goals of the biomedical enterprise, the nature of human flourishing, and the threat of dehumanization or the promise of superhumanization. 
They therefore compel attention to what it means to be a human being and to be active as a human being. And finally, they get us beyond our narrow preoccupation with the life issues of abortion, embryo destruction, and euthanasia, important though they be, to deal with what is genuinely novel in the biotechnical revolution. Not the old crude power to kill the creature made in God's image, but science-based sophisticated powers to remake him after our own fantasies. What exactly are the biotechnical powers that I'm talking about? What sorts of ends are they likely to serve? How soon are they available? They are powers that affect the capacities and activities of the human body, powers that affect the capacities and activities of the mind or soul, and powers that affect the shape of the human life cycle at both ends and in between. We already have powers to prevent fertility and to promote it, to initiate life in the laboratory, to screen our genes both as adults and as embryos, and to select or reject nascent life based on genetic criteria to insert new genes into various parts of the adult body and someday soon also into gametes and embryos, to enhance muscle performance and endurance, to replace body parts with natural or mechanical organs, and perhaps soon to wire ourselves using computer chips implanted into the body and brain, to alter memory, mood, desire, temperament, and attention through psychoactive drugs, and to retard aging and to prolong not just the average, but also the maximum human life expectancy. The technologies for altering our native capacities and activities include genetic screening and genetic engineering, drugs, especially psychoactive ones, and the ability to replace body parts or to insert novel ones. The avail availability of some of these capacities using th these techniques has been demonstrated only with animals, but others are already in use in human beings. Now, truth to tell, these powers have not been developed for the purpose of producing perfect or post-human beings. To the contrary, they have been produced largely for the purpose of preventing and curing disease and of reversing disabilities. Even the bizarre prospects of machine-brain interaction and implanted nanotechnological devices start with therapeutic efforts to enable the blind to see and the deaf to hear. Yet the dual-use dual use aspects of most of these powers encouraged by the ineradicable human urge toward improvement and the commercial interests that see huge market opportunities for such non-therapeutic uses, means that we must not be lulled to sleep by the fact that the originators of these powers were no friend to Brave New World. Once here, techniques and powers can produce desires where none existed before, and things often go where no one ever intended. One should resist the temptation to begin our reflections with the new techniques or even with the powers for intervening they make possible. To do so risks losing the human significance of the undertakings. Better to begin with the human desires that these powers and techniques are destined to serve, among them the desires for better children, superior performance, ageless bodies, happy souls, and a more peaceful and cooperative society. In this lecture, I will concentrate mainly on the strictly personal goals of self-improvement and self-enhancement, and especially on efforts to improve performance, to preserve and augment the vitality of the body, and to increase the happiness of the soul. These goals are arguably the least controversial and the most continuous with the aims of modern medicine and psychiatry, better health, peace of mind, and most attractive to most potential consumers, probably indeed to most of us. These were, in fact, the very goals now at last in the realm of possibility that animated the great founders of modern science, Francis Bacon and Rene Descartes. Flawlessly healthy bodies, unconflicted and contented souls, and freedom from the infirmity of age, perhaps indefinitely. Now, although my discussion will be driven by humanistic rather than technological considerations, you should know that there really are biotechnical approaches and innovations already serving these purposes. For example, in pursuit of ageless bodies, first we can replace worn out parts by means of organ transplantation or in the near future by regenerative medicine using tissues produced from stem cells. Second, we can improve upon normal and healthy parts, for example, via precise genetic modification of muscles through injections of growth factor genes that keep the transformed muscles whole, vigorous, and free of age-related decline. 
and most radically, we can try to retard or stop the entire processes of biological sen senescence. Especially noteworthy are recent discoveries in the genetics of aging showing that the maximum species lifespan of worms and flies can be increased from two to six-fold by alterations in a single gene, a gene now known to be present also in mammals, including human beings. In pursuit of happy souls, we can eliminate psychic distress, we can produce states of transient euphoria, and we can engineer more permanent conditions of good cheer, optimism, self-esteem, and contentment. Accordingly, we have drugs that, when administered properly, promptly when memories are forming, blunt markedly the painful emotional content of the newly formed memories of traumatic events, so-called memory blunting or erasure, a remedy which is being sought to prevent so-called post-traumatic stress disorder. We already have simple euphorians like ecstasy, the forerunner of Huxley's soma, widely used on college campuses. And we have powerful yet seemingly safe antidepressant and mood brighteners like Prozac, wonderful for the treatment of major depression, yet also capable in some people of utterly changing their outlook on life from that of Eeyore to that of Mary Poppins. <laughs> now the first of four parts of the lecture following this introduction is called Problems of Description, the Distinction Between Therapy and Enhancement. People who have tried to address our topic have usually approached it through a distinction between therapy and enhancement. Therapy, the treatment of individuals with known diseases or disabilities. Enhancement, the directed use of biotechnical power to alter by direct intervention, not diseased processes, but the normal workings of the human body and psyche. Those who introduce this distinction hope by this means to distinguish between the acceptable and the dubious or unacceptable uses of biomedical technology. Therapy is always ethically fine. Enhancement is, at least prima facie, ethically suspect. Gene therapy for cystic fibrosis or Prozac for psychotic depression is fine. Insertion of genes to enhance intelligence or steroids for Olympic athletes is not. This distinction is useful as a point of departure. Restoring to normal does differ from, be going, from going beyond the norm. But it finally proves inadequate to the moral analysis. Enhancement, even as the term, is highly problematic. Does it mean more or better, and if better, by what standards? Can both improved memory and selective erasure of memory be in both enhancements? If enhancement is defined in opposition to therapy, one faces further difficulties with the definition of healthy and impaired, normal and abnormal, especially in the areas of behavioral or psychic functions and activities. Some psychiatric diagnoses are notoriously vague and their boundaries indistinct. How does social anxiety disorder differ from, from shyness, hyperactivity disorder from spiritedness, oppositional disorder from the love of independence? Furthermore, in the many human qualities, for example, like height or IQ that distribute themselves normally, does the average also function as a norm or is the norm itself appropriately subject to alteration? Is it therapy to give growth hormone to a genetic dwarf, but not to an equally short fellow who is just unhappy to be short? And if the short are brought up to average, the average, now having become short, will have a precedence for a claim to growth hormone injections. <laughs> Needless arguments about whether or not something is or is not an enhancement gets in the way of the proper questions. What are the good and the bad uses of biotechnical power? It does not follow from the fact that a drug is being taken solely to satisfy one's desires, for example, to sleep less or to concentrate more, that its use is objectionable. And conversely, certain interventions to restore normal functioning wholeness, for example, to enable postmenopausal women to bear children or 70-year-old men to keep playing professional ice hockey, might well be dubious uses of biotechnical power. This last observation points to the deepest reason why the distinction between healing and enhancing is finally insufficient. For the human whole whose healing is sought by biomedical therapy is finite and frail, medicine or no medicine. The healthy body declines and its parts wear out. The sound mind slows down and has trouble remembering things. 
The soul has aspirations beyond what even a healthy body can realize, and it becomes weary from frustration. Even at its fittest, the fatigable and limited human body rarely carries out flawlessly even the ordinary desires of the soul. Moreover, there is wide variation in the natural gifts with which each of us is endowed. Some are born with perfect pitch, others are born tone deaf. Some have flypaper memories, others forget immediately what they have just learned. And as with talents, so too with the desires and temperaments. Some crave immortal fame, others merely comfortable preservation. Some are sanguine, others phlegmatic, still others bilious or melancholic. When nature deals her cards, some receive only from the bottom of the deck. As a result of these infirmities, human beings have long dreamed of overcoming limitations of body and soul, in particular the, lim the limitations of bodily decay, psychic distress, and the frustration of human aspiration. Until now, these dreams have been pure fantasies, and those who pursued them came crashing down in disaster. But the stupendous successes over the past century in all areas of technology, and especially in medicine, have revived the ancient dreams of human perfection. We major beneficiaries of modern medicine are less content than we are worried, less grateful for the gifts of longer life and better health, and more anxious about losing what we have. Accordingly, we regard our remaining limitations with less equanimity, even to the point that dreams of getting rid of them can be turned into moral imperatives. <coughs> For these reasons, thanks to biomedical technology, people will be increasingly tempted to pursue these dreams, at least to some extent. Ageless and ever vigorous bodies, happy or at least not unhappy souls, and excellent human achievement with diminished effort or toil. Why should anyone be bothered by these prospects? What could be wrong with efforts to improve upon human nature, to try with the help of biomedical technology to gain ageless bodies and happy souls? I begin with some familiar sources of concern. Part two is called the familiar sources of concern. Not surprisingly, the objections usually raised to the beyond therapy uses of biomedical technologies reflect the dominant American values, health, equality, and liberty. First, health, issues of safety and bodily harm. In our health-obsessed culture, the first reason given to worry about any new biological intervention is safety, and that is true also here. Athletes who take steroids will later suffer premature heart disease. College students who take ecstasy, I warn you, will suffer early Parkinson's disease. To generalize, no biological agent used for purposes of self-perfection will be entirely safe. Anything powerful enough to enhance System A is likely to be powerful enough to harm System B. Yet many good things in life are filled with risks, and free people, if properly informed, may choose to run them if they care enough about what is to be gained thereby. If the invention, interventions are shown to be highly dangerous, many people will later, if not sooner, avoid them, and the Food and Drug Administration and tort liability will constrain many a legitimate purveyor. But if the inter interventions work well and are indeed highly desired, people will freely accept in trade-off even considerable risk of later bodily harm. And in any case, the big issues have nothing to do with safety. The real questions concern what to think about the perfected powers, assuming that they may be safely used. So second, equality, issues of unfairness and distributive justice. An obvious objection to the use of personal enhancers by participants in competitive activities is that they give the users an unfair advantage. Blood doping or steroids in athletes, stimulants in students taking the SATs. But this objection also does not reach to the heart of the matter. Even if everyone had equal access to brain implants or genetic improvement of muscle strength or mind-enhancing drugs, a deeper disquiet would still remain. Even were steroid or growth hormone use by athletes legalized, most athletes would be ashamed to be seen injecting themselves before coming to bat. Besides, not all activities of life are competitive. It would matter to me if she says she loves me only because she is high on erotogenin, a new brain stimulant that mimics perfectly the feeling of falling in love. It matters to me when I go to class that the people with whom I'm conversing are not drugged out of their right minds. 
The distributive justice question is less easily set aside than the unfairness question, especially if there are systematic disparities regarding access to the powers of biotechnical improvement. The case becomes more powerful when we consider the expenditure of money and energy on such niceties in a world in which the basic health needs of millions go unaddressed. It is embarrassing, to say the least, to discover that in 2002, for example, Americans spent $1 billion on baldness, roughly 10 times the amount spent worldwide for research on malaria. But once again, the inequality of access does not remove our disquiet to the thing itself. And it is, to say the least, paradoxical in discussing the dehumanizing dangers of, say, eugenic choice, that people complain that the poor will be denied equal access to the danger. The food is contaminated, but why are my portions so small? Check it out. Yes, Huxley's Brave New World runs on a deplorable and impermeably rigid class system. But would you want to live in that world if offered the chance to enjoy it as an alpha, the highest class? Even an elite can be dehumanized. Even an elite can dehumanize itself. The central matter is not the equality of access, but the goodness or the badness of the thing being offered. The third familiar objection has to do with liberty, issues of freedom and coercion, overt and subtle. This comes closer to the mark, especially with uses of biotechnical power exercised by some people upon other people, whether for social control, say in the pacification of a class of Tom Sawyers, or for their own putative improvement say with genetic selection of the sex or sexual orientation of the child-to-be. This problem will, of course, be worse in tyrannical regimes. But there are always dangers of despotism within families, as parents already work their wills on their children with insufficient regard to a child's independence or long-term needs or to the freedom to just be a child. Even partial control over genotype say to take a relatively innocent example, musician parents selecting a child with genes for perfect pitch could add to the existing social instruments of parental control and its risks of despotic rule. There are more subtle limitations of freedom, say through peer pressure. What is permitted and widely used may become mandatory. If most children are receiving memory enhancement or stimulant drugs to enable them to get ahead, Failure to provide them for your child might come to be seen as a form of child neglect. If all the defensive linemen are on steroids, you risk mayhem if you go against them chemically pure. And a point subtler still, some critics complain that, as with com cosmetic surgery, Botox, and breast implants, the enhancement technologies of the future will likely be used in slavish adherence to certain socially defined and merely fashionable notions of excellence or improvement very likely shallow, almost certainly conformist. This special kind of restriction of freedom, let's call it the problem of conformity or homogenization, is in fact quite serious. We are right to worry that the self-selected, non-therapeutic uses of the new powers, especially where they become widespread, will be put in the service of the most common human desires, moving us towards still greater homogenization of human society perhaps raising the floor, but greatly lowering the ceiling of human possibility and reducing the likelihood of genuine freedom, individuality, and greatness. Indeed, such homogenization may be the most important society-wide concern if we consider the aggregated effects of the likely individual choices for biotechnical self-improvement, each of which might be defended or at least not objected to on a case-by-case -case basis, but which gives rise to problems by what the economists cause, call uh, negative externalities. For example, it might be difficult to object to a personal choice for a life-extending technology that would extend the user's life by three healthy decades, or a mood-brightened way of life that would make the individual more cheerful and untroubled by the world around him. Yet the aggregated social effects of such choices widely made could create a tragedy of the commons where genuine and sought-for satisfactions for individuals are nullified or worse, owing to the social consequences of granting them to everyone. And I will myself later argue such a case with respect to the goal of increasing longevity with ageless bodies. But once again, important though this surely is as a social and political issue, 
it does not settle the question regarding individuals. What, if anything, can we say to justify our disquiet over the individual uses of performance-enhancing genetic engineering or mood-brightening drugs for other than medical necessity? Why are we bothered by the voluntary self-administration of agents that would change our bodies or alter our minds? What is disquieting about our freely chosen attempts to improve upon human nature? The essential reasons to be concerned about these activities and where they may lead us have something to do with challenges to what is naturally human and to what is humanly dignified. Accordingly, I will make two extended arguments, one on each of these themes. First, the dignity of unadulterated human activity threatened by unnatural means, and the nature of full human flourishing threatened by spurious, partial, or shallow substitutes. The third and the long, longest section is called Unnatural Means, the Dignity of Human Activity. Until only yesterday, teaching and learning or practice and training exhausted the alternatives for acquiring human excellence, perfecting our natural gifts through our own efforts. But perhaps no longer. Biotechnology may be able to do nature one better, even to the point of requiring no teaching and less training or practice to permit an improved nature to shine forth. The insertion, for example, of the growth factor gene into the muscles of rats and mice bulks them up and keeps them strong and sound without the need for nearly as much exertion. Drugs to improve memory, alertness, and amiability could greatly relieve the need for exertion to acquire these powers, leaving time and effort for better things. What, if anything, is disquieting about such means of gaining improvement? The problem cannot be that they are artificial, unnatural in the sense of having man-made origins. Beginning with the needle and the fig leaf, man has from the start been the animal that uses art to improve his lot. By our very nature, we are constantly looking for ways to better our lives through artful means and devices. Ordinary medicine makes extensive use of artificial means from drugs and surgery to mechanical implants in order to treat disease. If the use of artificial means is absolutely welcome in the, heal in the activity of healing, it cannot be their unnaturalness of origin alone that makes us uneasy when they are used to make people better than well. Still, in the areas of lo human life where excellence has until now been achieved only by discipline and effort, the attainment of those achievements by means of drugs, genetic engineering, or implanted devices looks to many people to be cheating or cheap. Many people believe that each person should work hard for his achievements. And even if we prefer the grace of the natural athlete or the quickness of the natural mathematician, people whose performance deceptively appears to be effortless, we admire also very much those who overcome obstacles and struggle to achieve the excellence of the former. This matter of character, the merit of disciplined and dedicated striving, though not the deepest basis of one's objection to biotechnical shortcuts, is surely pertinent. For character is not only the source of our deeds, but also their product. Healthy children whose disruptive behavior is remedied by pacifying drugs rather than by their own efforts are not learning self-control. If anything, they're learning to think it's unnecessary. People who take pills to block out from memory the painful or hateful aspects of a new experience will not learn how to deal with suffering or sorrow. A drug to induce fearlessness does not produce courage. Yet things are not so simple. Some biotechnical interventions may assist in the pursuit of excellence without cheapening the attainment. And many of life's excellences have nothing to do with competition or adversity. For example, drugs to decrease drowsiness or increase alertness, sharpen memory, or reduce distraction may actually help people to pursue their natural goals of learning or painting or performing their civic duty. Drugs to steady the hand of a neurosurgeon or to prevent sweaty palms in a concert pianist cannot be regarded as cheating, for they are not the source of the excellent activity. And for people dealt a meager, meager hand in the dispensing of nature's gifts, it should not be called cheating or cheap if biotechnology could assist them in becoming better equipped, whether in body or in mind. Nevertheless, there is a different sense in which the naturalness of means matters. 
The trouble is not that the assisting drugs and devices are artifacts. The issue is rather that their use might distort human agency and undermine the dignity of the naturally human way of being at work in the world. And this is the theme I'd like to develop. Consider, in most of our ordinary efforts at self-improvement, whether by practice or training or study, we sense the relation between our doings and the resulting improvement, between the means used and the ends sought. There is experiential and intelligible connection between the means and the ends. We can see how confronting fearful things might eventually enable us to cope with our fears. We can see how curbing our appetites produces self-command. The capacity to be improved is improved by using it. The deed to be perfected is perfected by doing it. This is just straight Aristotle. And it's, by the way, true. Um, <laughs> in contrast, biotechnical interventions act directly on the human body and mind to bring about their effects on a subject who is not merely passive, but who plays no role at all. He can at best feel their effects without understanding their meaning in human terms. Thus, a drug that brightens our mood would alter us without our understanding how and why it did so, whereas a mood brightened as a fitting response to the arrival of a loved one or an achievement in one's work is perfectly, that is, because humanly, intelligible. And not only would this be true about our states of mind, all our encounters with the world, both natural and interpersonal, would be mediated, filtered, and altered. Human experience under biological intervention becomes increasingly mediated by unintelligible forces and instruments separated from the human significance of the activities so altered. The relations between the knowing subject and his activities and between his activities and their fulfillments and pleasures are disrupted. The importance of human effort for human achievement is here properly acknowledged. The point is not the exertions of good character against hardship but rather the humanity of an alert and self-experiencing agent making his deeds flow intentionally from his willing, knowing, and embodied soul. To be sure, an increasing portion of modern life is mediated life, the way we encounter space and time, the way we reach out and touch somebody via the telephone or internet. But so long as these technologies do not write themselves directly into our bodies and minds, we are in principle able to see them working on us and free, again in principle, to walk away from their use. But once they work on us in ways beyond our ken, we are, as it were, passive subjects of what might as well be called magic. We become, in a sense, more and more like artifacts, creatures of our chemists and bioengineers. The same point can also be made, perhaps, about enhanced achievements as about altered mental states. To the extent that an achievement is the result of some extraneous intervention, it is detachable from the agent whose achievement it purports to be. That I can use a calculator to do my arithmetic, arithmetic does not make me a knower of arithmetic. If computer chips in my brain were to download a textbook of physics, would that make me a knower of physics? If human flourishing means not just the accumulation of external achievements and a full curriculum vitae, but a lifelong being at work, exercising one's human powers well and without impediment, our genuine happiness requires that there be but little gap, if any, between the dancer and the dance. Let me try to deepen the analysis by using the example of athletes taking performance-enhancing drugs. Once their habit is discovered, their performances seem less real, less their own, less worthy of our admiration. Why? Because athletes on steroids, despite hitting more homers or clocking faster times, are diminished as athletes. Not simply because they cheated their opponents, but because they also undermined and corrupted themselves and the very athletic activity in which they seem to excel. The dignity of human sport or any other human activity is determined not simply or predominantly by the measured and separated result, but also by who achieves it and how. Seen not as a detachable deed but as an activity of an agent, <clears throat> athletic performance depends on both the doing of a deed and the identity of the doer. Yes, the goal of competitive running is to cover the set distance as quickly as possible, but this is only part of the story. The man on roller skates moves faster than the runner, but he obviously engages in a different activity, 
moving quickly but not running, and thus should not be judged, should be, thus should be judged according to a different standard, not the standard of natural human activity. Animals run often quickly. Unlike the mechanized movement in animal running, doer and deed are seamlessly united. Yet although the average cheetah runs much faster than the fastest human being, we do not honor the cheetah in the same way as we honor the Olympic runner, because the Olympic runner runs in a human way as a human being. When an athletic performance is seen as the deed of a performer, we do not separate the result, the fastest time, from the activity, human running. We do not, in fact, separate what is done from how it is done and who is, who is doing it from the fact that it is being done by a doer. And we should not separate the score from the purpose of keeping score in the first place, to honor and promote a certain human excellence whose meaning is in the doing, not simply in the scored result. Tomorrow's box score is but a ghostly shadow of today's game. Consider another example the best human chess player playing a chess playing computer, an outstanding human facing off against an outstanding human artifact. But are man and machine really playing chess? Can we really compare the superior capacity of a computer to play chess with the distinctive excellence of a human chess player? On the Walton level, of course, they are indeed engaged in the same game according to the same rules. Yet the computer plays the game rather differently with no uncertainty, nervousness, sweaty palms, playfulness, or active mind, and with no desires or hopes regarding possible future success. The computer's playing is, in fact, a mere simulation, not the real thing, playing chess. By building computers that play perfect chess, we have changed the meaning of the activity itself, and we, reoriented the very, we reorient the very character of our aspiration, from becoming great human chess players to become better chess playing machines, or if you prefer, from becoming great chess players to producing the best executed game of chess. Why, if chess is no more than the sum of opposing moves that are in principle calculable by a machine, would human beings wish to play chess at all, especially if the machines can do it better? And for the people who are on the machine side of this, I, I simply submit no one would sit and watch two machines playing chess against each other. The answer to this question of why we play chess at all is at once simple and complex. We still play chess because only we can play chess as human beings, as genuine chess players. Likewise, we still run because running, while not as fast as moving on wheels, possesses a dignity unique to itself and unique to those who engage in it. The runner on steroids or with genetically enhanced muscles is still, of course, a human being who runs. But the doer of the deed is arguably less obviously himself and less obviously human than his unaltered counterpart. He may be faster, but he may also be on the way to becoming more cheetah than man or more like the horses we breed for racetrack than a self-willing, self-directed human agent. What exactly is the specific difference of a human act or performance? What are the qualities that make us admire the performance as human activity and as the performer's own? We can get help here from a useful distinction known to moral philosophy. Not all acts done by humans are human acts. That is, acts that spring from the roots of our humanity. Not all acts done by persons are personal acts. What then makes an act of humans genuinely a human act? What makes a deed truly one's own? Comparison with the doings of other animals again proves helpful. In the activity of other animals, there is necessarily a unity between doer and deed. Acting impulsively and without reflection, an animal, unlike a human being, cannot deliberately feign activity or separate its acts from itself as their immediate source. Yet although a cheetah runs, it does not run a race. Though it senses and pursues its prey, it does not self-consciously seek a goal or harbor ambitions to surpass previous performances. Though its motion is not externally compelled, it does not run by choice. Though it moves in ordered sequence, it has not planned the course. Its beauty and excellence it owes to nature and instinct alone. In contrast, the human runner chooses to run a race and sets before himself his goal. He measures the course and prepares himself for it. 
He surveys his rivals and plots his strategy. He disciplines his body and cultivates his natural gifts to pursue the goal. The end, the means, and the manner are all matters of conscious awareness and deliberate choice. The racer's running is a human act humanly done because it is done freely, knowingly, and by conscious choice. So far, so good. But if the humanity of our actions rests solely on their being rooted in knowledge and conscious choice, we face this difficulty. Is not a decision to enhance our bodies through drugs or genetic intervention also a matter of human choice? If it is the presence of free knowing and conscious choice that makes an act human, then the bulking up of the genetically or drug-induced athlete and derivatively his drug-assisted superior performance would seem to be preeminently human or even superhuman a manifestation of our ability to transcend natures and our personal limitations in a way no animal can. This welcome objection invites a somewhat fuller account with a three-part response, one regarding the mind, one regarding body, the third regarding their peculiar interrelations as expressed in athletics and human activity more generally, as well as in the crucial matter of human desire and aspiration. The point about the mind has already been prepared by my earlier discussion of the difference between gaining superior performance through training and practice and gaining superior performance through biotechnical engineering. We called attention to the differences between perfecting a capacity by using it knowingly and perfecting a capacity by means bearing no relation to its use and between changes to our bodies that do and those that do not proceed through intelligible and self-directed action. Thus, though the decision to take anabolic steroids to enhance athletic performance can be said to be, in one sense of the term, a rational choice, it is, unlike the choice to adopt a better training regimen, a calculating act of will to bypass one's will and intelligibility altogether. But biotechnical enhancement errs not only by, by embracing exaggerated and self-contradictory willfulness. Mistakenly identifying the human with the merely rational, it also neglects the significance of our embodiments. For the humanity of athletic performance resides not only in the chosenness and intelligibility of the deed. It depends decisively on the performance of a well-tuned and well-working body. The body in question is a living body, not a mere machine. Not just any animal body, but a human one. Not someone else's body, but one's own. Each of us is personally embodied. Each of us lives with and because of bodily gifts that owe nothing to our rational wills. Each of us not only has a body, each of us also is a body. In few activities is this truth more manifest than in sports. When we see an outstanding athlete in action, we do not see, as we see in horse racing, a rational agent whipping a separate animal body. We see instead a body gracefully and harmoniously at work, but at work with discipline and focus and tacitly obeying the rules and requirements of the game. We know immediately that the human runner is engaged in deliberate and goal-directed activity, that he is not in flight moved by fear or in pursuit moved by hunger. Yet while the human character of his running is at once obvious, the mindedness of his bodily activity is tacit and unobtrusive. So attuned is his body, and so harmonious is it with heart and mind, that in the best instance, the whole activity of the athlete appears effortlessly to flow from a unified and undivided being. At such moments, the athlete experiences and displays something like the unity of doer and deed one observes in other animals, but with this difference. The human, for humans, that unity is a notable achievement far transcending what other animals are capable of. A great sprinter may run like a gazelle, a great boxer may fight like a tiger, but one would never mistake their harmony of body and soul for the brute instinct that spurs an animal toward fight or flight. In trying to achieve better bodies through muscle enhancing agents, pharmacological or genetic, we do not in fact honor our bodies or cultivate our individual gifts. We are instead, whether we know it or not, voting with our syringes to have a different body with different native capacities and powers. We are giving ourselves new and foreign gifts, not nature's and not our own, and exaggerating but in the direction of the truth, 
treating ourselves rather as if we were batting machines to be perfected or superior horses bred for the race and bound to do our bidding. These acts of will do not respect either our own individuality or the dignity of our own embodiment. Finally, the third moment in this argument has to do with desire and aspiration, which is at the root of all human activity. Human aspiration for excellent activity, for performances memorable and great, this is not finally the product of pure reason or pure will. Neither is it merely the product of our animality, of the fact that we have bodies. It stems rather from that peculiar blending of mind and desire, perhaps peculiar to human beings, called by the Greeks eros, the longing for wholeness, perfection, and something transcendent. In one formulation, it is the desire of the good to be one's own, always. The root of this longing lies in the awareness that, alas, we are not entirely unified and undivided beings. We are the rather fail, frail and finite in body and conflicted in soul. Being conscious of our finitude and self-division, we strive to make of ourselves something less imperfect, something more noble, something fine, something that would be fulfilling as much as humanly possible. Further, we pursue this aspiration as ourselves, and at least to begin with, for ourselves. For we would not seek excellence on condition that, in order to attain it, we would gladly have to become someone or something else. It is doubtful, to say the least, that biotechnological transformation of our bodies or minds will contribute to realizing this goal for ourselves. The ironies of biotechnological enhancement of athletic performance should now be painfully clear. First, by turning to biological agents to transform ourselves in the image we choose and will, we in fact compromise our choosing and willing identity itself, choosing to become less than normally the source and shapers of our own identity. We take a pill or insert a gene that makes us into something we desire, yet only by compromising the self-directed path toward its attainment. Second, by using these agents to transform our bodies for the sake of better bodily performance, we mock the very excellence of our own individual embodiment that superior performance was meant to display. Finally, by using these technological means to transcend the limits of our natures, we deform also the character of human desire and aspiration, settling for externally gauged achievements that are less and less the fruits of our own individual striving and cultivated finite gifts. There is, we might add, no limit in principle to the desire to transcend the limits of our own nature. The desire to have a perfect body, one that perfectly executes the dictates of the will, is tantamount to a desire to transcend our embodiment altogether, to become as gods, to become something more than human. The longing for, per per for perfection, it is true, has inspired many of the greatest human achievements. But unless guided by some idea of the character of human perfection, such longings risk becoming a full-scale revolt against our humanity altogether. Biotechnology seems to promise the triumph of the will with less willing effort and bodily excellence in bodies not quite ours. We can become what we desire without being the responsible embodied agents of our own becoming. A more human course begins by accepting that we cannot will ourselves into anything we like. It seeks to live with the dignity of being willing, self-directed, embodied, and aspiring persons, not biological artifacts, not thoroughbreds or pitching machines. Better, in other words, to be great human runners with permanent limitations than non-human artifacts bred to bake, break records. The uh, last part, shorter than the third, it's going to run me a little over uh, with my apologies. Part four, partial ends, full flourishing. In taking up first the matter of questionable means for pursuing excellence and happiness, I put the cart before the horse. I've neglected to speak about the goals. The issue of good and bad means must yield to the question about good and bad ends. What are we to think about the goals of ageless bodies and happy souls? Would their attainment, in fact, improve or perfect our lives as human beings? These are very big questions and too long to be properly treated here, but the following considerations may open them up for you. The case for ageless bodies seems at first glance to be pretty good and looking better year by year. Um, the prevention of decay, decline, and disability, 
the avoidance of blindness, deafness, and debility, the elimination of feebleness, frailty, and fatigue, all seem to be conducive to living fully as a human being at the top of one's powers, of having a good quality of life from beginning to end. We have come to expect organ transplantation for our worn out parts. We will surely welcome stem cell based therapies for regenerative medicine, reversing by replacement the damaged tissues of Parkinson's disease, spinal cord injury, and many other degenerative disorders. It is hard to see any objection to obtaining in our youth a genetic enhancement of all of our muscles that would not only prevent the muscular feebleness of old age, but would empower us to do any physical task with much greater strength and facility throughout our lives. And should aging research deliver on its promise of adding not only extra life to years, but also extra years to life, who would refuse it? Even if you might consider turning down an ageless body for yourself, would you not want it for your beloved? Why should she not remain to you as she was back then when she first stole your heart? Why should her body suffer the ravages of time. To say no to this gift seems perverse, but let me suggest that it is not. Indeed, the heap, deepest human goods may be ours only because we live our lives in aging bodies, made mindful of our living in time and inseparable from the natural life cycle through which each generation gives way to the one that follows it. Yet because this argument is so counterintuitive, we need to begin not with the individual choice for an ageless body, but to look first at what the individual's life might look like in a world in which everybody made the same choice. Let's make the choice universal and see the meaning of that choice in the mirror of its becoming the norm. What if everybody lived life to the hilt, even as they approached an ever-receding age of death in a body that looked and functioned, let's not be too greedy, like that of a 30-year-old? Would it be good if each and all of us lived like light bulbs, burning as brightly from beginning to end, but then popping off without warning, leaving those around us suddenly in the dark? Or is it perhaps better that there is a shape to life, everything in its due season, the shape also written, as it were, into the wrinkles of our bodies that live it? What would the relations between the generations be like if there never came a point at which a son surpassed his father in strength or vigor? What incentive would there be for the old to make way for the young if the old slowed down but little and no, had no reason to think of retiring, if Michael could play until he were not 40 but 80, or if most congressmen, God help us, could serve for more than 60 years? <laughs> and might not even a moderate prolongation of lifespan with vigor lead to a prolongation in the young of functional immaturity? of the sort that arguably has already accompanied the great increase in the average life expectancy experienced in the past century. For we cannot think of enhancing the vitality of the old without retarding the maturation of the young. Going against both common intuition and my own love of life, I have tried elsewhere to make a rational case for the blessings of mortality. I now give it only two cheers. Uh, in an essay entitled L'Chaim and Its Limits, why not immortality? I suggest that living self-consciously with our finitude is the condition of the possibility of many of the best things in human life. Engagement, seriousness, a taste for beauty, deep loves, the possibility of virtue, the ties born of procreation, the quest for meaning. Though the arguments there are made against the case for immortality, they have weight also against even more modest prolongations of the maximum lifespan, especially in good health, which would permit us to live as if there were always tomorrow. For it is, I submit, only our ability to number our days that enables us to make them count. A preoccupation with personal agelessness is finally incompatible with accepting the need for procreation and human renewal. Both for individuals and a whole society, to covet a prolonged lifespan for ourselves is both a sign and a cause of our failure to open ourselves to procreation and indeed to any higher purpose. It is probably no accident that it is a generation whose intelligentsia proclaim the death of God and the meaninglessness of life that embarks on life's indefinite prolongation and that seeks to cure the emptiness of life by extending it forever. For the desire to prolong youthfulness is not only a childish desire to eat one's life and keep it, it is also an expression of a childish and narcissistic wish 
incompatible with devotion to posterity. It seeks an endless present, isolated from anything truly eternal, and severed from any true continuity with past and future. It is in principle hostile to children, because children, those who come after, are those who will take our place. They are life's answer to mortality, and their presence in one's house is a constant reminder that one no longer belongs to the frontier generation. One cannot pursue agelessness for oneself and remain faithful to the spirit and meaning of perpetuation. Those who think that having an ageless body would solve the problems of growing old ignore the psychological effects simply of the passage of time, of experiencing and learning the way things are. After a while, no matter how healthy we are, no matter how respected and well-placed we are socially, most of us cease to look upon the world with fresh eyes. Little surprises us, nothing shocks us, righteous indignation and injustice dies out. We have seen it all already. We have seen it all. We have often been deceived. We have made many mistakes of our own. Many of us become small-souled, having been humbled not by bodily decline or the loss of loved ones, but by life itself. So our ambition begins to flag, or at least our noblest ambitions. As we grow older, Aristotle already noted, we aspire to nothing great and exalted and crave the mere necessities and comforts of existence. At some point, most of us turn and say to our intimates, is this all there is? In many ways, perhaps in the most profound ways, most of us go to sleep long before our deaths, and we might do so even earlier in life if awareness of our finitude no longer spurred us to make something of ourselves. Assume for the sake of argument that at least some of these consequences would follow from a world of greatly increased longevity and vigor. Would it be simply good to have an ageless body? Is there not some wisdom in the goodness of the natural human life cycle, roughly three multiples of a generation, a time of coming of age, a time of flourishing, ruling, and replacing of self, and a time of savoring and understanding, but still sufficiently and intimately linked to one's descendants to care about their future and to take a guiding, super supporting, and cheering role? What then about pharmacologically assisted happy souls? Painful and shameful memories are disquieting. Guilty consciences disturb sleep. Low self-esteem, melancholy, and world weariness besmirch the waking hours. Why not memory blockers for the former, mood brighteners for the latter, and a good euphoriant without risks of hangover or cirrhosis when celebratory occasions fail to be jolly? For let's be clear, if it is only imbalances of neurotransmitters that are responsible for our state of soul, it would be sheer priggishness to refuse the help of pharmacology for our happiness while we accept it guiltlessly to correct for an absence of insulin or thyroid hormone. Seeking happiness through pharmacology, I suggest, is dubious on two grounds, each having to do with the shrunken view of happiness that informs such a quest and the limiting and limited sort of happiness that would be attainable with the aid of drugs. Regarding the removal of psychic troubles, truth to tell, some suffering and unhappiness are probably good for us. And regarding the creation of psychic satisfactions, the mere fragrance of happiness should not be mistaken for its real flowering. Notwithstanding the reality of serious mental illness and the urgent need to treat it, with drugs, of course, if necessary, there is something misguided about pursuing utter psychic tranquility or attempting to eliminate shame, guilt, and all painful memories. Tra traumatic memories, shame, and guilt are, it is true, psychic pains, and in extreme doses can be crippling. Yet short of the extreme, they can also be helpful and fitting. They are, after all, the appropriate responses to horror, disgraceful conduct, and sin, and they help us to avoid or fight against them in the future. Witnessing a murder should be remembered as horrible. Doing a beastly deed should trouble one's soul. Righteous indignation depends on being able to feel injustice's sting. An untroubled soul in a troubling world is a shrunken human being. Moreover, to deprive oneself of one's true memories in their truthfulness also of feeling is to deprive oneself of one's own life and identity. The positive feeling states of soul, especially those inducible by drugs, though perhaps accompaniments of human flourishing, are not its essence. Erzat's pleasure or feelings of self-esteem are not the real McCoy. 
they are at most but shadows divorced from the underlying human activities that are the essence of human flourishing. Not even the most doctrinaire hedonist wants to have the pleasure that comes from playing baseball without swinging the bat or catching the ball. No music lover would be satisfied with getting from a pill the pleasure of listening to Mozart without ever hearing the music. Most people want both to feel good and to feel good about themselves, but only as a result of being good and of doing good. There appears to be a profound connection between the possibility of feeling deep unhappiness and the prospects for genuine happiness. If one cannot grieve, one has not loved. And to be capable of aspiration, one must know and feel lack. As Wallace Stevens put it, not to have is the beginning of desire. In short, if human fulfillment depends on our being creatures of need and finitude, and therewith of longings and attachment, there may be a double-barreled error in the pursuit of ageless bodies and factitiously happy souls. Far from bringing us what we really need, pursuing these partial goals could deprive us of the urge and energy to seek a richer and more genuine flourishing. It is to repeat the peculiar gift of our humanity to recognize the linkage between our unavoidable finitude and our higher possibilities. As Plato Socrates observed long ago in the symposium, the heart of the human soul is eros, an animating power born of lack but pointed upward. At bottom, human eros is the fruit of the peculiar conjunction of and competition between two competing aspirations conjoined in a single living body, both tied to our finitude, the impulse to self-preservation and the urge to reproduce. The first is a self-regarding concern for our own personal permanence and satisfaction. The second is a self-denying aspiration for something that transcends our own finite existence and for the sake of which we spend and even give our lives. Other animals, of course, live with these twin and opposing desires, but only the human animal is conscious of their existence and is driven to devise a life based in part on the tension between them. In consequence, only the human animal has explicit and conscious longings for something higher, something whole, something eternal, longings that are ours precisely because we possess this bodily doubleness, which we elevate and direct upwards through conscious self-awareness. Nothing humanly fine, let alone great, will come out of a society that has crushed the source of human aspiration, the germ of which is to be found in the meaning of the sexually complementary two that seek unity and wholeness and willingly devote themselves to the well-being of their offspring. Nothing humanly fine, let alone great, will come out of a society that is willing to sacrifice all other goods to keep the present generation alive and intact. Nothing humanly fine, let alone great, will come from the desire to pursue bodily immortality or pharmacological happiness for ourselves. I'm almost at the end. Looking into the future at goals pursuable with the aid of new biotechnologies, we can turn a reflective glance at our present human condition and the prospects now available to us to live a flourishing human life. For us today, assuming that we are blessed with good health and a sound mind, a flourishing life is not a life lived with an ageless body or an untroubled soul, but rather a life lived in rhythm time, mindful of time's limits, appreciative of each season, and filled, first of all, with those intimate human relations that are ours only because we are born, age, replace ourselves, decline, and die, and know it. It is a life of aspiration made possible by and born of experienced lack, of the disproportion between the transcendent longings of the soul and the limited capacities of our bodies and minds. It is a life that stretches towards some fulfillment to which our natural human soul has been oriented, and unless we extirpate the source, will always be oriented. It is a life not of better genes and enhancing chemicals, but of love and friendship, song and dance, speech and deed, working and learning, revering and worshiping. If this is true, then the pursuit of an ageless body may prove finally to be a distraction and a deformation. The pursuit of an untroubled and self-satisfied soul may prove deadly to desire. If finitude recognized spurs aspiration and fine aspiration acted upon is itself the core of happiness. 
not the agelessness of the body, not the contentment of the soul, not even the list of external achievements and accomplishments of life, but the engaged and energetic being at work of what nature uniquely gave to us is what we need to treasure and defend. All other perfections may turn out at best to be but passing illusions, at worst a Faustian bargain that could cause us our full and flourishing humanity. Thank you for your patience. Thank you so much, uh, Leon. Duncan, do you have the, uh, the, the microphone? We're, we're going to uh, ask the questioners to uh, use the microphone so that it can be picked up uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the videotaping equipment. Uh, so uh, we have a tradition in the Madison program to uh, give students the first shot, if there are any undergraduates or graduate students or students from other institutions or high school students uh, who are here and would like to ask a question. Uh, Leon, maybe I, I, I'm tempted to ask before making up my mind whether I agree with you about uh, being against these uh, memory erasing drugs. Do, do, do they blunt uh, memories of election returns? I'd like to know. There are pendulums. Right? <laughs> yeah, there are pendulums. The rhythms of. They go this way. <laughs> they go that way. So, are there any uh, student questions? Yes. Despair is. Uh, well, well, go go ahead anyway. I, no, please do. Yeah, no, please. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions. I can, I can okay, uh, you spoke extensively about uh, sports competition, abuse of drugs, and so forth. And I wondered if you could attempt to formulate a concept of abuse of forthcoming or existing technologies and drugs and so forth. Uh, you know, abuses that would involve uh, violation of the of your principle of the. Uh, um, advantages of, of effort uh, and condemnation of laziness. Uh, that's my interpretation, partial interpretation, which we're saying. I wondered if you could, could elaborate on the concept of abuse of, of these technologies. Right. Um, the quick, was the question audible? The question really was dealt with in a very small part of the talk. I treated it as a serious but not the most serious objection um, and went past it. Um, look, I I think that, um, uh, you know, uh, we admire hard work and we admire people who get someplace as a result of their own efforts. But it really also is true that um, we admire the, the natural grace, too. Um, I, I mean, the natural grace, uh, in most cases, is also perfected by effort uh, and what seems like effortlessness is only the result of long, long practice. So that, that should be said. But I think, um, and uh, the question was pressed in our council: um, Who do you admire more, the scrappy Pete Rose uh, or the um, the graceful Ted Williams? Um, uh, and uh, being a short, not terribly athletic fellow myself, I would have always liked uh, in my youth. Pete Rose, but the truth of the matter is Ted Williams is really much more beautiful to watch. That's probably too old an example from you people. I give you Albert, I give you Albert Pujols, um, who's the closest thing I've, I've seen to him. But um, it seems to me that um, it's not so much that we feel people are getting away with something that should bother us, though that should bother us. It's more that Character is not the, just the source of our deeds, but also their product. And I did say that it seems to me if, if instead of trying to teach children self-control, you medicate them, they're not learning self-control. The character that's produced is a, is a character that believes that there's no need for self-control. We have other remedies. Um, and um, if every hardship is dealt with with medication, people will not learn endurance and strength of soul to deal with hardship, which is, after all, what you're interested in, in the subject of character. 
Um, what I try to do here, and um, I don't, um, this is, by the way, I should acknowledge the enormous help that I got in the preparation, especially of the stuff on athletics from my colleague Eric Cohen, uh, who, uh, uh, and, and Yuval Levin also helped very much on this report, Beyond Therapy, which uh, is in a way excerpted, or the guts of it are in a way presented here. What we tried to do was to present a, a kind of deeper anthropological objection to uh, the use of these enhancers that go beyond the question of cheating and laziness. Because in the end, um, uh, it, it seems to me it, it really is uh, a kind of perversion of our activity, even if we get no unfair advantage. Um, and I try to use then examples of, um, do, you, do you really want people to love you because they're on medication? Well, I, I offer this to some group of aging men, and to my horror, they said, well, of course they would like us. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, don't th I don't think any young person, I don't think any young person who's got half a heart um, wants, uh, wants to be loved because somebody's high on something. And it is really in those deformations of the natural expressions of our desire the way in which our deeds flow from our from this this peculiar unity of mind and body energized by desire and reaching by the way towards goals which are not stunted and factitious it's 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 the third and port, fourth fourth part which i don't think anybody i don't think those arguments have been made by anybody um, uh, i mean the the athletic part was the guts of that was in the third part and that's to try to give an account of what do you really mean by dignified human activity and I don't think the whole dignity of human activity comes from toil against adversity. I think it comes from exercising our powers, using our minds, setting our goals, not being, being as little self-divided within ourselves as we can. Um, so I, I, I take what you say. I mean, I think it's welcome. But I think that if we really want to teach, teach and this is, by the way, it's, it's the, the problem doesn't begin with drugs. The problem begins with uh, the turning of our athletes into entertainers and being interested in records rather than in the activity. Once you do that, um, you detach the you detach the activity from the performance, uh, the, the performance from the doer, and then what you're interested in, you'll do anything to get those numbers higher than the last person's. That is a corruption of the sport, which wasn't produced by drugs. Um, it. Uh, look, you look like a student. <laughs> Um, so uh, there's a psychological principle that when we face a complex situation, a change, losses loom larger than gains. We think about them more. We worry about them more. You've provided the most beautiful, moving description of what will be lost by these, by these technological changes. And you've, just, you've, you've given us terms that, that, that I didn't know before, ways of thinking. Well, uh, I, I, I only knew before from having read your previous work. But um, uh, <clears throat> so uh, my question is, um, might there be things gained that we can't know about now? And in particular, I'm thinking of the examples of caffeine and alcohol. If they did not exist now but were invented next year, caffeine has many of the same properties as Ritalin, just not as good, and alcohol has some of the properties of benzodiazepines, but not as good. Um, but these things, alcohol and caffeine, because they've been with us so long, they enter into very humanizing practices, coffee breaks, drinking with, a friend, with friends at the bar. So might it be the case that these new technologies, the problem with them is not the technologies and the changes that they will, will bring to us, but the pace of the change. If they could come more slowly, we could integrate them and humanize them and work them in with our natural human ways of doing things. Um, it's a very welcome question on multiple, on multiple grounds. Um, uh, uh, Needless to say, well, a, a number of things should be said. First of all, um, this was meant to be a cautionary tale only. Uh, but that was partly because I conceded that the desire for these things are well nigh universal, except for a few curmudgeons, <laughs> right? Um, and therefore, most people will go around saying, uh, distinguished members of this faculty go around advertising the benefits of all of these innovations and see none of the costs. What would be wrong with? Maybe there'd be bad social consequences, but what would be the matter of trying to get an ageless body for yourself, use medications to give yourself whatever mood or mental advantage you'd like, et cetera, and so forth. So um, 
I concede that there is some attractiveness, and I would even concede that there might in some circumstances be gained. Certainly, um, the, the most tempting thing for, for workaholics would be something to uh, enable us to sleep less and, and, and not feel it. Um, and we have these medications, uh, uh, modafinil, uh, which helps pilots stay awake longer, and certainly I hope the troops are using it. Uh, and the question is, well, um, have we really? Th I haven't tried to think this one through, but what would really happen if we all went on modafinil? We slept less. Um, well, the trouble with the societies, in fact, um, the trouble with the society is uh, that there's no Sabbath. Um, and uh, sleep is, in a way, the closest thing that many people have to it. Uh, so uh, there, 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 there are difficulties with, with that. But um, granted, um, certain things that might come uh, that would be disturbing could, in fact, be humanized, providing that one still has a clear understanding of what a human activity is in which to humanize it. Um, I don't think this is just the pace of change as a philosophical matter. As a sociological matter, you're of course right. The human being gets used to everything, Raskolnikov said, the beast. And one can go step by step. Oh, it's the wonderful line. I think it's Bertrand Russell. Pragmatism is like a warm bath. It warms up so imperceptively you don't know when to scream. And that, the fact that we could get used to all of these things and wind up in Brave New World and be so dehumanized even to the point of not knowing we're dehumanized, is no comfort to me. Then you say, well, come on now, that's just gloominess. Um, let's think about concrete examples like uh, caffeine and alcohol. Um, caffeine and alcohol have been around a long time, nicotine too. Um, they have been incorporated into human life in the form of social rituals. Uh, I don't think, um, I mean, some of us took no-dos in college stay up and study. But I don't think that given the social ritual, you'd sit down in a, in a coffee shop and uh, take your caffeine. Uh, that is to say, it, it is part of a larger social meaning uh, in which it plays a minor role, but it provides the occasion in a way for the human interaction. Uh, put yourself the question of whether or not what you really want to do instead of drinking coffee or having a smoke is taking your nicotine pill and uh, and, 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 and popping uh, and, and, and popping you popping the alcohol uh, by intravenous injection rather than drinking with a friend and um, uh, um, you know elevating the spirit um, preferably not too much uh, then the further question would be to say, look, you know, alcohol, nicotine, caffeine, they've been around a long time. And this is one of these kinds of ways in which people sort of say, well, we've had this a long time, so this is no big deal. Rather, it seems to me the contrary should be raised as a possibility. It might be in the prism of these new possibilities that one might reconsider the place of these particular uppers and downers in the, in the way in which we live. Um, is it really best that, I mean, it's not a question of a moral judgment in particular cases, but um, there are certainly lots of families who would tell you that it would be better if people didn't have that wherewith to drown their sorrows, but somehow learn to deal with them. Um, and to speak about chronic, the chronic elevation of, uh, uh, of, of, of the grape, um, the, you have the... Uh, the first vintner, Noah. I'm not going to turn this into a Bible class like yesterday. <laughs> I promise. Uh, is that is that? Uh, that's an answer. I, 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 if you're satisfied, I'm disappointed. But <laughs> please, uh, up in the in the row, please. Leon, woman. Even as you go over there, you have to speak to the so it'll be. Oh, am I walking too yeah. far away? Excuse me. Forgive me. I don't know if you address this previously. But I'm wondering about how you feel about the use of technology for producing children for infertile couples. Is that one of the no-nos, uh, a bad interference of technology, although you yourself have <clears throat> heavily praised procreation? Yeah. Um, this. Uh I thank you for the question. It's usually not act, 
asked with any generosity because some people know I wrote on this subject and was one of the early critics of in vitro fertilization. In the first instance, in the first instance, um, in the first instance, because of a concern for the well-being of the children to subject them to an experimental procedure, the safety of which for them uh, could not be ascertained. After the first in vitro child was born, uh, Louise Brown, 1978, um, I uh, uh, endorsed the practice for the treatment of intramarital infertility, but not for other kinds of uses. And at the same time, I worried not only about the technology there, but I said this is going to open the door to reproductive cloning. It's going to open the door to using embryos for research. It's going to open the door for genetic engineering of the next generation and so on. Uh, I haven't had to retract any of those uh, worries. In fact, there's every reason to be very concerned about it. And you don't have to think, you don't have to think that, an, that a five-day-old embryo is the equivalent of your grandchildren to find it bizarre that there are 400,000 human embryos in freezers. Um, that, I mean, that's, that's been the product of this. But if the question is, look, a couple is trying to have a child, there is infertility, the oviduct is blocked, and by the hand of science, one can give this an assistance. Um, though I have these worries, and though there is, uh, I'll expand on the danger in one minute, though that there are additional dangers in our thinking about this, uh, I think on balance uh, one accepts this, and one would accept it much more comfortably if one thought one has measures to draw the lines in proper places and hold them. Of that I'm not certain. The difference is something about this in vitro is something like this. Um, I, I mean, there are, there are in vitro children in my family, in effect, in large numbers. Um, and to my great pleasure, their parents don't regard these children as products of science, but rather as miracles. That speaks very well for them. I mean, they haven't somehow overrated the contribution of the scientist. They have somehow seen that into this previously, and I use the word in all its meanings, barren life for them, there is now the joy of a child who has sprung from their flesh. On the other hand, um, there is the beginning step in which one takes procreation into one's hands. Maybe not for the couple, but for the practitioners. And they begin to teach the message that the child is not somehow a gift to which we are open, but comes to be the product of our will. And it's a short step from that to well, only those children who actually measure up to our criteria will be allowed to let, let into life. So there is even in concept a kind of line that is being crossed here, however innocently and however for perfectly good reasons. And um, if, if, if there's any part of my teaching that I am eager for people to see is that even if on balance you embrace some of these things for humanitarian and compassionate reasons, don't think that you haven't paid a price. And as long as you remember the price, you might be prevented from paying an even steeper price. Um, it's not innocent to cut into dead bodies for their parts and to regard uh, the nearly dead as natural resources to be mined so that the living can live, even if on balance one says this is a way to redeem the end of a life so that others may live. It's important that we somehow understand these taboos and these things that have been violated. Otherwise, we are shrunk in the process of doing good. And I think that um, a deeper discussion of what, we, what price we may already have way, paid for going into the world of assisted reproduction is very much in order uh, if, um, if the costs of the great blessings that these have produced in individual families is not going to be too high. But um, uh, I hope that's... Uh, I think it came out very well, it, and I think reflects the. F I mean, I think it, it came out. I think I said what I meant in its in its in its fullness. Not not that it was. I, I don't think I have anything to add. Um, please, uh, Bill, and then Alan. Yes, I, I'd like to pursue the question of degradation for a moment, and without uh, taking what is really a very small part of your presentation, this discussion of athletics in, term, in relation to the pursuit of enhancement. Uh, I nevertheless want to use that example, and, and this is a true question. I don't hold the answer. This is not an Alenkis. Uh, I uh, would ask, 
you gave yourself the suggestion of the question when you spoke of celebrity, as in some way, celebrity, turning our athletes into ce celebrities, as in some way responsible for the tendencies that we're witnessing. And it makes me think that if it's the case that one once ran the race for the honor, ran it to win, uh, was it a significant moment when a purse came to be attached to it and one ran not for the honor but for the purse? And if one runs for the purse, not the honor, and then one opens oneself to enhancements in order to facilitate acquiring the purse, what truly is the source of the degradation then? Is it the factitiousness or is it the fact that we have posed the purse? Um, this, is a, this is a really rich question too and I, um, I haven't thought about it before so I'll, I'll put my toe in the water off the top of my head and start what might be a conversation uh, if not now I'm going. Um, one could make I move to go in a place you you won't expect. I move to say, look, we could make the same argument about um, artisans um, and uh, workers of all sorts um, who sell their labor. I think there were some famous people who talked about such matters and talked about this as, in some ways, uh, a, a degradation. That that was not the language they used. Alienation was good enough for those purposes. Um, I don't think you'd want to say that compensation by itself is the def would by itself be the deforming of the activity, though the tendency of corruption is right is really right there. Um, uh, and I guess I uh, now this is, this is nice. Um, I mean, I suspect that. Um, you know, if you're on a fifth place team in September, um, you play to get a higher contract somewhere else. Um, but for most of the season, I think when they're on the field, the fact that there's a gate is, is irrelevant. And when you see these guys jumping up and down like they're five years old, it's not, um, it's, it's not the money, it's the, it's, it's the glory of the victory. Um, this is not to say that the money hasn't corrupted lots and lots and lots and lots of things. But I'm not sure that it is degrading intrinsically of the activity itself any more than the basket weaver who gets paid for the basket isn't somehow flourishing when he or she weaves. Now, the, uh, if you want to stay in the athletic example further, and it, this reminds me, there are such few good movies to recommend. But everybody, if, you, if you're interested in this stuff, go and see again The Chariots of Fire, um, in which um, uh, um, the Scott, uh, Eric Little, is, uh, Little? Little. Little. Um, runs for God's pleasure. Um, and the other fellow, Abrams, um, runs to prove a point uh, against the vilification of his race. And he has a trainer. It's not money. He has a trainer. The trainer is barred from the arena. One thing that I didn't notice until the second or third time seeing the movie is the Americans come with trainers. They're not physically present, but there is nothing, you don't have the amateur there. They have been regimented. They've been regimented. And um, this is, in a way, the be something of the beginning of the sense that victory and records, not merely running beautifully. It doesn't, need not have to be running for God's pleasure, but one begins to see the transformation right at that point. Um, and so you could say, look, why the hell are you so upset about drugs? Let's, um, let's go back to uh, bamboo uh, poles, which is uh, what I saw the Reverend Bob Richards cross 15 feet with when uh, that was really something. Um, you know, let's, 
Let's get them those old tennis rackets. Let the baseball gloves not be like uh, you know, <laughs> garbage baskets. <laughs> um, uh, and okay, um, but uh, even if some of these degradations are on a continuum, it does seem to me that there is still the possibility that people will play with little gap between the dancer and the dance, and that the kind of natural grace and uh, human achievement shines forth. And uh, um, I have to say that despite all of my discontents with the way professional sports has gone, there's still just enough of it to keep me watching. Hmm? Please, uh, Alan. Thank you. Um, you gave a very beautiful account today, I think, between the tension between what we are and what we aspire to be. And on the one hand, you know, our, our fundamental human nature, and on the other hand, what is also part of our fundamental human nature, the desire to transcend our nature, to, or to transcend what we are in our finitude. And it, as you were talking, it seemed to me that a lot of your worries about biotech is uh, revolved around the fact that um, it would make it easier to pursue lower aspects of ourselves and your great fear is that it would come at the cost of pursuing the higher. Right. That's the last part. So, 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 so as I was thinking about that, I, I wanted to imagine um, a, a scenario where, so this might not be exactly biotech, but more like spirit tech and to see if some of this, the same you know, reasoning process that you went through would hold. Um, and so, and several times since you've been here, you talked about the godlike nature of man and, and the striving for, for the highest. So, suppose it was the case that there was a machine that we could go into in which grace would be revealed to us, or being would be revealed to us, that we would get some flash of the nature of what is. You, you, what, you have to go into a machine to well, have these intimations? Th th this is, you know, sometime, I, you know. <laughs> but, but, and, and, Wait till it stops raining and go outside. Well, see, but, well, and see, I mean, that's, right, because... I, I wait, go <laughs> Yeah. Um, when, when, you know, right. I mean, if we go when we go to church or to synagogue or to a play, and that's what we're looking for in in some a flash of inspiration, that kind of insight. And when we do that, there's something that you know, there's some sense in which we're doing some work there and participating actively in accordance with the faculties that we have. But there's also some sense in which we're hoping for something that we don't strictly speaking deserve. Right. That some insight to, to come to us beyond which we've, strictly speaking, merited. Um, so if, if there was some machine that could give us that, um, would, it, would, it, would you be in favor of that, or would that also be a kind of cheating? And, and say it was some, it gave us an insight, which would then, let's say, for, be a fundamental experience for our lives, Right, that it wouldn't simply answer all our questions, right? But it would be form a kind of anchor that the rest of our life would have to be spent trying to figure out what that experience meant, and that would somehow, though, you know, be guiding us. Um, from my own tradition, I would say that um, the necessary gift uh, has already been provided you. There were 600,000 witnesses. I'm doing Bible studies again, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, people heard the transcendent voice giving an account of what is required of us. Look, um, the remarkable thing, it's not in this talk, and uh, it's a relatively sort of new thought with me, and I shamelessly get it from Heschel, a little book called Who is Man, which I've read only for the first time in the last couple of months. Um, he has some comments on the first creation story, 
which for those of you who are interested in intelligent design is not either going to be proved or refuted by scientific kinds of queries. He suggests this isn't a cognitive account. This is a song about the glory that there is something rather than nothing. The remark, and it, God saw that it was very good. He then goes on to talk about how, what it means that the whole was commanded into being. And, or to put it another way, summoned. I think, uh, and this is not quite in his text, but it's, I've been, the real question that human beings have in the first instance is not um, who made all of this or where did it come from. The first question we, in a way, have at our core is what does it mean that we're here and what are we called upon to do to justify that fact? Now, uh, to, to somehow make good of the gift which is ours unmerited. Um, I don't think you need new machines. You need to be willing to formulate that sort of question as somehow the central. You, you need to allow to get past the, the miseducation that all of us have received and somehow come to that kind of question of disposition and orientation so that the, the various things that lie around us and uh, authors uh, of all traditions into whom some kind of inspiration has been breathed can speak to this. Um, I don't think it needs a spiritual machine. You just need to get the cobwebs out. Now, maybe, maybe you want to say, look, how about a machine to get the cobwebs out? <laughs> um, is that going to be some help, uh, Scott? On this on this point, I, I could use some help. There are people here. Who've... By, by the way, uh, this is your your question goes deeper than than this. But there are people who, on this longevity question, say, "Look, you get you you make people live longer or even forever. They'll lose their fear of death. And what are they going to spend their time doing? Worshiping God. Not a chance." <laughs> Please, up, up top. Dr. Cass, I wanted to say thank you. Uh, I think, from my perspective, this has been wonderful because it's articulately opened up a variety of issues. And you've done the near impossible, maybe even the impossible, in three short hours. I mean, you've covered these huge topics. I think the only frustration I feel at the end, and it's probably de you dealing with the public sector, you felt it also far more than I perhaps, is you start talking to your average layperson and, you, and it becomes politicized, it becomes an all or nothing, and you don't get the nuanced differences that you saw articulately spelled out. And I, I really appreciate what you've done. You've, you've, you've given us color television view as opposed to black and white issues, or even worse, that you see in our regular society, your average person on the street, it seems to me, doesn't, doesn't understand this issue even well enough to enter into the fray. Well, um, first of all, thank you for the kind words. Um, these kinds of, the, the subject for today is not a subject for politics. This is the subject for, the, the lecture of today is a, is a question for culture. It's a question of, the deficiencies of our humanistic education and our religious education, frankly, to give people the tools to um, feel more confident in the things that they know in their bones, but which, uh, alas, uh, the humanities have chosen not to help them express and, uh, and shore up, um, which is one of the reasons why talks why I like giving this particular talk at the university. Yesterday's talk uh, on euthanasia and so on, that's closer to a question for law and politics, and we will have it with us. And um, insofar as there are brave new worldly kinds of questions that do come into the public arena, um, and Professor George uh, will share my frustrations in this, there uh, it's very hard to get a hearing in the present uh, public climate partly because the extremes, if one can call them that, own the debate, at least when it comes to legislation. Um, 
the only public bioethics issue that you can really get out there on the table are, the, are issues connected with life, whether it be abortion or embryo destruction. Uh, it's very much harder to get some of these other things out there uh, and, and, and get uh, some find some common ground, where in fact I think there is some common ground. The council was deeply divided on the embryo question, yet we were able unanimously, and in a very bad time for the council, agree on some very modest, but I think deeply important legislative recommendations to uphold the dignity of human procreation. The council did splendidly, fell on deaf ears, and worse than deaf ears, uh, once it, it, it got beyond us. And um, so I, I I mean, the, the, the political questions are extremely difficult, and, they, and, and these are very subtle and deep things. And I don't expect uh, any kind of political discussion to be, I, I don't fault it for not taking it up in this particular way. Uh, I do fault the people who are writing and thinking about the subject who sort of shallowly say, what's wrong with this, wouldn't it be nice? Especially when they're writing big books about it. And um, you cannot, it seems to me you cannot talk about perfecting human beings or enhancing our life if you don't spend the time thinking about what a human life is, what a flourishing human life would be like, and uh, what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for bringing it about. That's a question for philosophy. That's a question that theology and religion help us with. That's a question which great literature has furnished the imagination for thinking about it. And the poverty, uh, the scientists are just doing their work, and a few of their bioprofits are sort of drunk on their success. The trouble is on the other side. There is uh, almost uh, no task I like less than having to close the question session, especially when we've had such uh, a rich set of uh, lectures uh, provoking such wonderful questions. And I'm sure if I didn't uh, cut it off, Leon would keep going because of his love of the, uh, of the conversation. But Judy Rivkin, she who must be obeyed, has tapped on my shoulder and reminded me that it's now time for us to uh, honor Dr. and Mrs. Cass with a little re reception, which I hope you will all uh, join us uh, for. Now, before I invite you to uh, join me in thanking Dr. Cass for this wonderful set of lectures, I'm going to pause for just a, a moment uh, for a commercial uh, uh, announcement. <laughs> Uh, and that is, I uh, want to invite all of you, and uh, this is going to be another wonderful occasion, to our third annual Herbert W. Vaughan Lecture on America's uh, Founding Principles. This is a very important uh, event uh, every year in the life of the Madison program. This year, we are uh, very pleased to uh, be presenting Professor James McPherson, the great Civil War historian, Professor Emeritus here at Princeton, who will be giving a very timely lecture uh, on uh, Abraham Lincoln's invention of presidential war powers. And that lecture, that Vaughn lecture, will be on November 20th, uh, Monday, November 20th, in Dodd's Auditorium, which is the main auditorium in the Woodrow Wilson School in Robertson Hall. And it is not at our usual time. Uh, Professor McPherson's Vaughn lecture on Monday, November 20th, will be at uh, 8 p.m. And now, echoing those marvelous uh, sentiments uh, from uh, Scott Lully, Leon, let me thank you uh, and Amy. Uh, for honoring us with your presence here and delivering these wonderful lectures. And let me invite our friends in the audience to join me in thanking you.